Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being uh, at this uh, special event uh, with uh, this nation Mekong and ATTA, which is Adventure Travel Trade Association. So my name is Catherine Germiamet, organization based in Cambodia, promoting the Mekong region as a sustainable tourism destination. So recently, this nation Mekong sign presented here by Hannah Pearson, which is the director for the Asian Pacific Asia region at ATTA. So Hannah will talk about uh, why it is so important, you know, that uh, we consider um, travel tourism as the next things to do. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, hello, um, wherever you are. Um, so I'd love to talk to you for the next 25 minutes or so about adventure travel and why should you care about adventure travel whether you are a destination whether you are a tour operator or whoever you are um why bother basically now it's always good to start and think about what actually is adventure travel you know before i start talking all about adventure travel i think it's always a wise decision to define what do we actually mean by adventure travel um and so when you think of adventure travel many people might think of this kind of image right you're pushing yourself it's cold and it's raining and it's hard work and you're challenging yourself and there's that adrenaline thrill um it could be something like this. Again, you're pushing yourself to an extreme. You're jumping into ice. Um, but I'm actually here to tell you that adventure travel does not have to be extreme. Adventure travel could be going for a walk in nature. It could be taking an e-bike and going around a city. doesn't necessarily have to happen out in a nature environment. It could be enjoying the local cuisine. It could be engaging with local cultures. It could be relaxing out in the spa and indulging in wellness activities. It could be getting to know the local wildlife. So for us at ATTA, adventure travel is a very wide concept. So we see it as having three main cons three main elements. So activity, nature, and culture. And when you combine them three together, that's what makes adventure travel. So adventure travel could have an element of challenge, sure. It could have that wellness that we just saw. It could be something new. It might be thinking about what your impact is on the community, your impact is on the environment. It could have an element of transformation for you. But when we think about adventure travel, it is not hardcore, it is not extreme. It can be a pretty wide definition and in that way, it makes it very applicable for everybody. Whether you are traveling as a multi-generational kind of trip, you're traveling with grandparents, grandkids, adventure travel could work for the young, it can work for the old, it can work for those um, with different capabilities, different abilities. What might be challenging for someone might be a walk in the park for somebody else. So for us, adventure travel is a very accessible term, a very open term for all of these different kinds of travel. And what I kind of want to set out to you um, and tell you about this afternoon is that really through this, adventure travel is one of the better ways to travel, not only for the planet, but for your business, for your, your destination as well economically. Who are ATTA? So the Adventure Travel Trade Association, we're originally a American-based company. Our headquarters is in North America. And we really have at our heart um, this ethos to protect nature, conserve cultural heritage, create shared economic value. So we believe that adventure travel is the best way to travel for the planet. But in doing so, it is not only prioritizing the environment, environmental sustainability, but is looking at What's the impact culturally? What's the impact economically to make sure that it's economically viable for communities to also be able to protect those environments, protect those local cultures? So why is adventure travel good for business and for destinations? 
Let's look at the numbers. Um, and this is always super interesting when you have a look at this because look how the adventure travel market compares versus the cruise industry. You know, cruise industry, $119 billion. This is back from 2018. In 2018, then it was $683 billion. So it's a much significant chunk. And, you know, it's a segment that a lot of people tend to think is kind of niche, but actually it's not. You know, it's got this, as we were saying, this kind of quite broad-reaching um, remit and not so far off global prescription drug sales. So it is a really um, enticing segment in terms of economic potential. Not only that, but if you're thinking about the impact on a community, it has a far greater impact. So $10,000 in the local economy just takes four adventure travelers. You compare that to nine overnight package tourists, and I think that's over 90 cruise tourists. Um, it is not an extractive kind of tourism. You can see for mass tourism, we found, according to our research, about 14% only of that revenue stays within the country. It generates about one and a half jobs. If you're looking at adventure travel, it supports almost you know, one extra job per $10,000. And that's because a lot of adventure travel is very people intensive, right? It does need that um, locals to go out and, and make it happen. But 65% of that revenue stays in the country that's benefiting the local economy that's not going out to those big countries. So it's really, you know, when we say it's a better form of travel, it, you know, it's a better form of travel for sure for that destination. If we look at what an average trip might be priced at, now every year the ATTA release our Adventure Tour Operator Snapshot Survey. So this is from last year, um, and last year's data was based on 2022. Soon we'll be releasing the new one, so look out for that. Um, but median trip price was about $3,000, and that's excluding airfare. They're staying for eight nights, a markup of around 25%. Um, so these are not budget travelers. And I think that's another common misconception, right? That that feeling that adventure travelers are budget travelers or are all backpackers. Um, and, you know, indeed, in many destinations, they're kind of lumped together, adventure travelers and backpackers. And for sure, yes, there are some backpackers who are adventure travelers, but there are equally some luxury travelers who are also adventure travelers. And you can see from that price point, 3000 USD, this is not always those backpackers, is it? It's you know, a very high value kind of tourism. Again, going back to this, how much does that stay in the local economy? Um, our survey last year showed around 76% of that was spent with local suppliers. And that's actually up. Um, past few years, it's been about 65 to 70%. So that's really increased. Um, and there's also a nice chunk of spend that is spent on local handicrafts, local souvenirs. And that's really going straight back to the those communities who produce them, you know, $189. Now, I think, you know, when we were in the heart of the pandemic, we didn't ever think that I think we'd be back at this point talking about over tourism and pre-pandemic challenges. That seems like a really long way away. But we're rapidly getting back to that point now. You know, I've started to see many articles coming out from places like Thailand or other destinations where we're starting to see over tourism. We're starting to see that tension between locals and tourists, that resentment sometimes even from locals towards tourists that's played up by the media um, without doubt. The fact that younger people are still leaving those rural areas from major metropolitan areas. We've got that brain drain. Um, this is just a few fairly recent headlines um, from Japan, from Indonesia, from Nepal along those lines, right? It's about bad tourism behavior. It's about trying to control the crowds. It's about, you know, that last year on Everest is one of the deadliest seasons. And how do you handle that? How do you handle this over tourism? Well, adventure travel can address these issues, this over tourism um, brain drain, but it has to be implemented strategically. Now, the great thing about adventure travel, for one, is that it's diversifying your source markets, diversifying away from potentially that mass tourism um, that you were 
previously headed down that path, it's giving you this whole other segment and through that different source markets. The other advantage for a destination for a tour operator is that it's dispersing people throughout the country. Um, so you're not getting those or you're trying to reduce anyway those areas which have been very reliant on that mass tourism, getting them out, getting them to see different places. And by doing that, dispersing um, that revenue to those local economies as well and giving those youths in those rural areas a reason to stay in the rural areas and not go out to the urban city. Of course, adventure travel could promote understanding. I think all tourism is the same. But, and we always have to say this, you know, destination management, that safety management, particularly when we're talking about adventure travel, is really paramount, right? That destinations, that operators have got all of those safety guidelines in place to implement adventure travel and don't just suddenly set up a zip line uh, with no sense of how is this going to impact local economy? How are people going to get there? How are people going to even be safe going on this thing? Um, so there's a lot of areas that people need to consider when they're thinking about adventure travel, but it can really be a way to mitigate a lot of these issues um, that we in the Mekong region are facing when we're starting to see again that over tourism. And then my last kind of point as to why is adventure travel good for a destination? Well, these are the kind of trips that people are looking at. Again, this is from our survey from last year. You can see people want remote destinations and trails. They want greener, uh, less impact itineraries. They want to travel off peak. I mean, that's fantastic. It was actually a new one um, for last year, but that's fantastic for tour operators because that's going to extend your season. You know, it's no longer the high and low season. These are the kind of travelers who don't mind traveling on the shoulder season, who can extend that for you. And they want to travel for longer. And of course, staying longer in a destination um, means ultimately higher value tourists because they, they're staying and they're spending more as they're staying there. So what are some other adventure travel trends that you should know about right now? Well, another myth, I think, around adventure travel is that adventure travelers are young. Um, they're not necessarily young. You can see the bulk of adventure travelers are between... You've got this 21% who are age 35 to 44, and very, very little from our um, survey results. Anyhow, our customers coming in from that young backpacker kind of demographic. You can see 2023. It went up a little bit. And if you remember, this is based on 2022. And in 2022, Southeast Asia had only really just started to kind of reopen. All right. So there was still this very much this mentality, at least overseas, that Southeast Asia is closed destination. So I think it would be really interesting to see how this has increased as we have the next 2024 tour operator snapshot survey. Where are adventure travelers coming from? Um, generally for us, longer haul markets. So we're talking about the US, we're talking about UK countries like Netherlands, France, so European countries, but even India is in there. And this is interesting because I think that there is really this perception that Asian travelers are not adventure travelers. And that is definitely not the case. I think they are in the minority, but it is a growing segment. And certainly you talk to people from India, you talk to people from China, this is growing. Um, this segment for adventure travel. People want to go out. They want to expand and um, push those boundaries. And, you know, I was talking to an Indian tour operator about this last year, and he kind of commented, well, look, you know, the, the younger generation grew up going on um, camping trips at school. They're used to going outdoors and doing this kind of adventurous activities, whereas, you know, my generation didn't really do that. So slowly those demographics are kind of changing in some of these emerging economies, which is really interesting. Where are they going? Um, majority for our respondents were to the US, but we also have some Latin America. We have Japan, which is the first time that an APAC destination hit our top 10. And of course, last year we held our Adventure Travel World Summit in Japan. So I think a lot of interest uh, was generated through that. Um, but there's really an opportunity here, you can see for Southeast Asia, because there are not 
any other Asian countries other than Japan here. And of course, we have plenty of opportunities. So what are the top adventure activities? And this just really reinforces what I was saying, right? That adventure travel is not hardcore. It doesn't have to be hardcore because the top activity is hiking, trekking, walking. And this is always, nearly always the top activity throughout the years. Every time we do this survey, it's always hiking, trekking, walking. So these are not the people who are skydiving, throwing themselves out of a plane. They want to get places by foot. They want to get there slowly. They want to enjoy their encounters with local people, local wildlife as they go along. There's also a lot of focus there on the environment. Again, we've got safaris and wildlife viewing. We've got bird watching in there. Lots of cycling, whether that is mountain biking, whether that is road biking, whether that is e-biking. Cycling is the thing. Wellness, cultural, gastronomy. Um, there's a lot of focus on those softer adventures, not just hard adventure. So why do people want to go for adventure travel? And it's interesting, again, here you can see that a lot of these experiences, uh, people want to have things new. They want to go off the beaten track. There's a lot, again, around local encounters, traveling like a local cultural encounters. There is an adrenaline rush, which is interesting, but it was new for last year. So as I said, it's not all about adrenaline. For some people, it could be. Um, and interestingly, um, last year was also to go on popular adventures. So I think this is very much that that impact that social media has and people looking and going, oh, that looks amazing. I want to go there too. How about for Asia? What are the top trending activities? And for us, number one is culture. And last year also was culture. So culture is really the thing that people is drawing people to Asia. And I would say that that's really one of our advantages here because we do have some cultures that are so completely different for the US markets, for European markets. And you can see for Europe, yes, culture is up there too. But I would argue for an American going to Europe, that cultural element is going to be a lot less different than an American coming over um, to Southeast Asia, right? They, they're going to really um, experience something very different to what they would see to their everyday life. It's number one, hiking, trekking, walking, culinary, of course, not a surprise. And you can see culinary third across all regions so food is really a driver there cycling and photography that wildlife and nature and of course um you know in the Mekong region we have all of those activities and all of those opportunities so it, we're perfectly placed to be able to take advantage of them what's happening in terms of what guests are looking for Again, it's swinging towards unique activities. They want authenticity. They want locally produced food and drink. They want to be able to interact with local people. These, these are the really important things um, that guests want. And what suppliers have been doing, again, within our ecosystem is something very similar. They've been doing lots of collaboration with locals. They've been also looking in terms of their internal sustainability, economic sustainability, making sure that their employees are compensated fairly adapting products to be more sustainable by default, um, which I find really interesting. And again, if you're looking at buyers, so the difference here is these are, say, the travel agents as opposed to the tour operator or DMC on the previous slide, is very similar again, right? It's about making things more sustainable by default. Um, there's, there's really this swing towards not letting people have a, a say, right? You have to opt out, not opt in. And I think that that switch in mentality is, is a really powerful one. We've also seen our tour operators start to really diversify markets as a result of COVID-19. So a lot are increasing focus on families, um, older travelers, female travelers. And, you know, we've seen, I think, globally this rise of the 50 something female solo traveler who is going off and, and wanting to experience. And we've seen the same for adventure travel too, that there's this growing segment there. Another reason why I can say, you know, adventure travel is a better way to travel. is just this focus on sustainability and the fact that the industry as a whole takes sustainability extremely seriously. So this is another survey that we did around um, US adventure travelers. And you can see that they are a lot more likely to factor in those environmental considerations when they're making um, 
their decisions. And even in fact, just in terms of what actions they take in their daily life, they're just a lot more likely to engage with these kind of green activities than a general um, US consumer. So they really have sustainability in their mind. Now, what that means for you as a, an operator or as a destination is it means that you can't greenwash them, right? They are not easily tricked. It's it's not that you can say this is a sustainable trip and then you hand them a single use plastic bottle and a sarong coming out of a single use plastic wrapping, right? They will call you out on that and they will be very vocal around that. So you need to be careful if you're, if you're really... Um, saying you're sustainable we've seen with all of the greenwashing um legislation that's going on in europe and other places ongoing at the minute you need to deliver what you're saying you are doing now in terms of our community at ATTA, we're actually seeing an increased number of those who are really pursuing certification um so 68 percent now have or are working towards a sustainability certification majority for us of the travel life um, for tour operators ATTA also have a partnership together with them but that's actually up from 45% in 2021, so that's really leaped. Um, and ATTA are planning to implement um, criteria where our members must either have certification or are pursuing certification to be a member that we'll implement in the next couple of years. Because for us, sustainability is extremely serious. It's extremely fundamental for adventure travel. Without the environment, and whether that's culture, whether that's people, whether that's the economy, you can't have adventure travel. Our operators are really concerned about conservation issues, tourism issues. They're concerned about over-tourism, wildlife protection, climate change, communities. These are the issues that are keeping them up at night. So I wanted to just share with you a little bit more about the ATTA. Um, so as I mentioned at the top, we're a US-based organization. We've got about 30,000 within our community, the majority of whom are tour operators. And we have some tourism boards, we have adventure media, people at the likes of National Geographic, for example. Basically, anybody who kind of touches the adventure travel industry, we have as part of our larger um, ecosystem. Where are our members? Um, the majority of North America, not a surprise. Again, as I said, we're a North American organization originally. Um, but for, for me, in charge of APAC, my good news this year is that we finally caught up with our Latin American colleagues. So we are at 16.4% for APAC. But for me, I also know that there's so much more potential um, than just 16% given our large populations, given the amazing adventure travel experiences that there are uh, not only in Mekong, but in Southeast Asia and, and APAC in general. And so for me, my goal is to grow that and to grow the community. We have different levels of membership ranging from community membership, which is completely free, and that will give you access to a lot of the reports um, that I was just sharing with you. And we regularly release reports throughout the year with snapshots about what's going on in the tourism industry, handy hints, and so on, through to business membership, which gives you other um, benefits, such as discounts to our events, um, on access to our, uh, to our um, educational programs too. We've recently launched our Sustainability Resource Center, which we're really proud of. It's completely free. Um, anybody can log on. You can just scan that QR code there. Um, and it will give you lists of pretty much try to put everything we can find around sustainability resources into one place to make it easy for tour operators, destinations, whoever you are in that sustainability journey um, to get started. And we're very well known for our events. Um, so we have Adventure Elevate, which is our Europe event um, coming up just next week. We have Adventure Elevate North America, which is in Asheville in June, and our Adventure Travel World Summit in Panama in October. So the Adventure Travel World Summit brings together around 800 people from the adventure travel community um, worldwide. Four day event, um, great fun. Last year, uh, Catherine was actually a, a panelist at our Hokkaido um, edition and had a fantastic time. Uh, so if you need any more information about that, just feel free to reach out to me. And we're really excited to have two events in APAC this year. So we have our Adventure Week Okinawa in November and Adventure Next in Fiji as well. And both of those are currently open for buyer and media um, applications. 
lastly, we'll be having our Adventure Connect ITB Asia um, on Thursday, 24th of October this year. You can sign up for it already. So it's going to be on the show floor at ITB Asia the second day of the show towards the end. Um, it's always good fun. It's a great place to gather. And what I'm really hoping to do this year is to hold more what we call Adventure Connect. So member or non-member meetups, people who are passionate about adventure travel throughout the region. So I'm looking to host one in Bangkok, Ho Chi Minh City, some in Australia, New Zealand even, um, just to bring the community together. So I just wanted to finish up really by summing up when we think about adventure travel and who the adventure traveler is, that an adventure traveler is not only what a destination wants, right? They want to have high spending tourists, but it's actually what a destination needs. These are tourists who are going to go to more remote places in your country. They're going to help with over tourism. They're going to stay longer. They're going to be more engaged with the community. They're going to be more passionate about making a difference in terms of sustainability and safeguarding communities and safeguarding the environment. Um, this, I think, is really what makes adventure travelers special and why you as a tour operator, as a tourism business, as a destination, um, should be thinking about how you could get into adventure travel. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And of course, any questions, don't hesitate to email me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. <laughs> Can we ask some questions now as well? If you want, if you want, have you got <laughs> questions? <laughs> I have, uh, I have two questions. Mm. Um, let me just uh, put yeah. them together again. Um, okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So a, a lot of the numbers you showed just now mm. they were based off a member survey. Yeah. Or yes. a traveler survey. Um, it's a bit of both. So every year we email out to our members, members and non-members to get this information. So this year we're actually pushing a lot more for non-members also to answer um, so that we can have a greater kind of uh, yeah, knowledge of what's going on globally. Okay. So, but that means basically the it's quite, I want to say, skewed. It, it is, to yes, towards, towards North American and European operators. And yeah. European. So yeah. what, from your experience, what would you yeah. say is the main difference between adventure travelers from Asia and from mm. those markets? Yeah, that's a good one. It's hard because we don't have that concrete um, concrete results. But I would say kind of anecdotally, it's probably in terms of perhaps length of stay. I mean, especially if you're looking at holiday allowances for like, Europeans, Europeans have a lot more holiday, right, than, uh, than we, unfortunately, in Asia tend to have. So I think there's probably differences between that. I imagine there's differences in destination preference as well. Uh, and there's always, you know, people always want to go further from home, right? So maybe Asian travelers perhaps are slightly less interested, potentially, in exploring the backyard and going to those dream destinations like Switzerland, for example, mm. or Finland. Um, <laughs> so but, no, it's okay. Anecdotal, though. Yeah, I, I was. A, yeah, it would be interesting maybe if 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 there mm. were a survey. Yeah, and then we only and we also analyze the Asian component of it. Absolutely. I was a bit surprised that Germans are not there, but French are there amongst the top <laughs> markets. That's a bit surprising, <laughs> um, but yeah. that might be because a lot of Germans uh, buy a package to us. It's that's possible. Could be. Could be. Um, yeah. So, would you define? It mm. looked a little bit like you would define an adventure traveler. Is yeah. anyone but mass tourists? Um, not really. I would say that you've definitely still got that activity element within it, right? I would say that there is still that element of getting out into nature rather than opposite of... So someone could be a part-time adventure traveler, basically. Yeah, yeah, they could be, yeah. And yeah, maybe they could... go stay in a resort and go out and do some adventure travel for a couple of days and come back. It could absolutely be a combo of Yeah, things. because the number seems very astonishing, the the total um, uh, market mm. size of adventure traveler. Yeah, uh, I mean, these were my two questions. Um, as always, Hannah, your presentations are always very interesting because of all the... <laughs> <laughs> nice statistics you show. Um, are there any uh, other questions? I see this uh, cheat is here. Mia, do you have any questions? No, not yet. 
<laughs> you know everything. Yes, I mean we we will publish we will publish this uh, presentation online, and if there are questions and and obviously if there are membership requests, yeah. um, uh, anyone can contact me. Hana. Yes. Um, which is the next event you'll go to, Hana? Um, um, will you go to Europe in May. I'm not, unfortunately, I don't get to go to uh, our Austria event, but I'll be at Panama, which will be exciting. So that's my next big ATTA one. And um, yeah, we have our ATB Asia usual meetup in October as well. But um, I'll let you guys, I'll, I'll let Destination Mekong know if we're holding any other meetups in the region. And, um, you know, for sure, Destination Mekong members are very welcome because these are events that are always open to members and non-members of ATTA. Great. Yeah. So, um, um, well, I'm, I'm I'm very excited about this partnership with Atta, and um, uh, I, I I look forward to to see how we can work this out with, with between Destination Mekong and you. Um, Catherine, do you wanna do you have any questions? Do you want to add something? Uh, no, thank you so much. Uh, I do not have any specific question, but I wanted to highlight that uh, I attended the ATT event in uh, Japan, in uh, Hokkaido uh, last year, as well as uh, the ATT event at ITB Asia in Singapore. And I was very uh, interested in uh, the training opportunities also offered by uh, ATTA. And especially uh, there was this case of uh, almost uh, rebranding Jordan, uh, initially as a culture um, uh, destination, tourism destination, to an adventure uh, travel destination. And I thought uh, it was very relevant uh, for some countries in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and especially Cambodia, for example, where uh, we know that, uh, you know, uh, the temples and Angkor Wat, uh, Angkor Archaeological Park are taking too much uh, room. And um, I was very interested in how we could also promote uh, our training from ATTA in Cambodia to uh, rebrand, uh, to help the, um, not necessarily rebranding, but also, you know, uh, a more uh, diversified uh, offering uh, in Cambodia, uh, considering that there are a lot of uh, nature, uh, natural uh, wildlife assets, uh, and of course, adventure uh, activities, which in my opinion, uh, totally fit, you know, the situation in Cambodia, uh, because this is really adventure. So I wanted to, I hope we can have, uh, you know, more presence of ATTA in Cambodia, but also in the rest of the Mekong region. So thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, Jordan is an amazing example of how you can, um, you know, go beyond just Petra and that, that World Heritage mm -hmm. Site. Um, you're right, I think Cambodia um, and many other countries feel, even Japan, I think, is, is, is feel quite inspired by what um, how Jordan has managed to to do that. So very exciting, and uh, well, um, I hope we meet again, Hannah. Uh, we meet very often. Uh, not necessarily, that, uh, we are always happy to meet. So thank you so much for your participation, and of course Mia as well. Uh, very appreciate you know your support, and uh, it was really a, a real pleasure you know to develop this uh, MOU with you. And so now let's make it real. Let's uh, implement some projects together, and uh, this is really exciting. It's a great adventure with you guys. And thank you, Garrett, yeah. of course. Thank you, Catherine, and good mm. to see you again in ADD event mm. shortly. Mm. That will be a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Then I, I close this meeting. Hada, thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for listening. And thank you, and Thank you, Catherine. We'll see you again soon for another session. And uh, uh, please feel free to contact us as well at uh, info.destinationmekong.com if there are any concerns or questions. Have a Thank good day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a nice week, guys. Bye.